And hello everyone, this is Ali Azzedin from 4 Generation 4 Education and I can see on, in that chat that the whole planet is watching. Uh, India, France, Belgium, uh, Italy, Philippines, uh, Netherlands, Hungary, Pakistan, Romania, Germany, Indonesia, Lebanon, uh, Azerbaijan. So everyone is here for this uh, great session. I'm so excited to collaborate again with you, Anne. I missed you last year and uh, you're back uh, for this uh, one hour webinar. Um, we're live on Facebook. We're live here on Zoom. Many people are joining us and let's give it a start uh, on um, let's go. Thank you, Ali. It's nice to be here. Hey, yeah, I think sort of COVID took me by surprise and I just had to kind of recalibrate, but I, uh, uh, I'm here now and I'm delighted to be here actually and uh, to give back to community, to connect with the community. And somehow I feel and I'm not sure if it's uh, the same for you, um, Ali, but um, there is a silver lining in all of this. Hey, we were just talking about this. Um, I think we figured out that we can connect online, that we can learn with each other and that um, uh, technology just helps us uh, to learn and, and somehow it becomes more democratic, hey, because we can put things out there, we can connect with each other just so much easier than the traveling and everything that that involves. So I am really delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Hey, so I thought before I share, I'll um, talk a little bit about who I am for those of you who don't know me yet, but I'd love to meet you uh, either online or face to face somewhere on this beautiful planet uh, one day, who knows. Uh, so, but I've been a teacher for a long, long time. I've been a school leader. I've lived in Singapore, in Switzerland, and then in 2015, I moved back to the Netherlands and I um, thought, you know, with sort of readjusting to uh, my home country that I do um, some consultancy work. And then the IB invited me to uh, work with them on the PYP review. For those of you who don't know this, this is an um, international organization that has um, programs, developed programs for schools. Um, so this was a really exciting opportunity, I think, for me to work with a team that was um, responsible for curriculum development. Uh, so we looked at the PYP and thought about ways that we could enhance it. Um, so alongside that work, I also work with international schools, um, traveled the world, met so many uh, wonderful people. It's been amazing. Uh, but I also realized that, you know, that work is uh, very intense and you travel a lot, different places, different people, um, jet lag, all of it. <laughs> so after a while, I kind of felt the need to connect uh, with the community again. And I had started volunteering at a local PYP school in The Hague, which is my hometown. And I felt really enticed by this experience and somehow it seemed so important, right? Um, this idea of a, uh, the first PYP school in the Netherlands, uh, a local school in a, um, it's an inner city school. Uh, it's a context where for some children, and you know, like it's a quite challenging context that they grow up in. Um, so uh, at some point I said to the director, I said, well, if you have a job, let me know. And well, the rest is history. So at the moment, uh, alongside the work that I do as a consultant, I um, teach four and five year olds um, at the school, which is a delightful experience. It sort of goes back to, you know, what I used to do when I started, um, you know, working in education. So it's been a delightful experience. It really is. Let's say that we met 10 years ago, Anne. Uh -huh. Yes, we and did. It was in India, you remember? Yeah. So you were yeah. running the first, like one of those first time doing the play-based workshop. Yeah. And then I flew yeah. from Dubai to attend this workshop and we kept all this connection. So let's see, what did you prepare for us today? Yeah, well, you know, we're going to think about how do we facilitate change in early childhood settings. Um, so I thought, you know, I have a couple of big questions for you that I would like you to engage in the chat box, hey, that we are going to generate some responses. Um, so the big questions are, for example, you know, what drives your intentions uh, in your work alongside children? Uh, what is the identity that you give to children? And how can we perhaps rethink the way we think about children's identities, their rights and responsibilities? And I would like also to spend some time to think about, you know, what is the identity we give to learning? You know, what are the ideas that come to our mind when we think about learning? You know, how would you define learning? And how would you think about how young children learn best? And then last but not least, you know, because I think this flows from, you know, what we believe about children and learning, you know, how can we achieve a way of planning in response to what we've noticed? Uh, and then there'll be time for questions. 
All right. Good. Let's yeah. give it a start. Well, there we go, Ali. Hey, so first I kind of want to talk with you a little bit about this idea of reaching shared understandings. Hey, and I have to say that in all the places that I've worked with uh, in my consultancy work with schools, um, the school that I'm at right now, I'm always looking for, you know, what's a What's going on here? You know, what are the values that people have? What they, are their shared understandings about play, about, you know, why children go to school? And I think it's really important to have those conversations because if we continue to discuss, you know, what we believe about learners, what, how we see their rights, their responsibilities, how we define learning, you know, what happens is, is that over time, particularly when we write this down and it becomes a statement, you know, that over time we reach shared understandings and we define the values. So. What this does, I think, over time, and I've seen this again and again, you know, when I work with uh, groups of people, is, is that it gives us an anchor that helps us to make decisions about lunch, about the timetable, about documentation, about the way we plan, about the way we interact with families. Um, so it really guides us in the decisions that we make. Um, and I think that that's really important. So I think the point that I want to make, you know, and this is a really important one, I think that all teams when they work together, but particularly schools in an international uh, context where there's a lot of transient, uh, transients, right, people come and go, you know, that you have to develop this together because it helps you to stay uh, on course um, and it helps you to make decisions uh, and to uh, think about ways that you also want to develop your own professional learning, because you will be able to also identify you think that are already going really well, but maybe other things, you know, in your toolbox of, you know, being in uh, a teacher, you know, that you want to develop further. So this is a big question that I would like you to consider for a while, because that's kind of linked to, you know, creating a um, uh, philosophy statement, isn't it? Hey, like really being very aware of, you know, what drives your intentions for children's learning? What do you find really important? Hey? You could also think about it as, you know, like, if you had to choose, what would be something that you'd never, you know, get rid of, you know, like, um, so, for example, it could be time to interact with individual children, it could be play, it could be materials um, and the exploration and the awe that comes from open ended experiences, it can be anything, but I'm inviting you now to um, put some responses in the chat box and see you know what we can generate together. So in that chat box, the wonder of learning through play and discovery, their curiosity, passions, ability, a play, agency, joy, curiosity coming back, a thinking, choice, and play, uh, giving them a real voice, connection, wonder, curiosity again. Uh, we need to make sense of the things around them, exploration, passion, and the chat is becoming very fast. And so these are some of the few words, engagement, provocation, time, uh, opportunity for children to explore, relating to real life, giving multiple choices, interaction with each, which, with each other, and uh, questions to become lifelong learning, uh, sophistication of thinking, and many more. Fantastic. And check on Facebook, so maybe Scott is watching us, so let's say hi to Scott and to all our friends uh, uh, watching and interacting. Feel free also to uh, uh, interact on Facebook. I'm having a look on your chat on Facebook. And then I'm going to finish with the word love and joy for love. Beautiful, beautiful. So one thing that I would advise you to do, you know, uh, whether you're part of an uh, early childhood team or, or even, you know, with all the children, um, or whether you're a, a school leader is to talk about the identity we give children. So what I mean by this is I know in you know, Reggio they talk about image of child. What I mean by this is, you know, what are the kind of ideas, the feelings, the thoughts, the um, that we have about who children are, right? What comes to your mind when you think about children, particularly, you know, their rights uh, and responsibilities, but do we even position ch children as uh, holders and bearers of right say eh? uh, do you view, view them as competent because some people might see them as more vulnerable 
Uh, do you see children as meaning makers, as thinkers, or do you see them more as, you know, people that kind of blank, you know, when they step into the world and that we need to fill them with ideas? You know, these are really important things, I think, for you to research and to think about because it will have an impact on the decisions that you make on a daily basis. So when I started working at the school in uh, The Hague, you know, we took uh, a lot of time to think about this question of like, who is a child, right? Um, which is kind of an abstract question when you think about it. Um, so we talked about this for a long time and we generated ideas. Everybody uh, wrote things on strips of paper and then we put them together and we looked at the things that we had in common. Um, and so this is part of our philosophy statement, you know, that we def really see each child as a unique, human being and that every child is rich in um, potential. We also feel that children have rights and responsibility, uh, responsibilities and we view them as kind of open. Um, and the rest, you know, that's there on that statement is there because we wanted to acknowledge that the children that we work with come from very different identities, right? Uh, we work with a lot of children who uh, come from um, families with migrant, migrant backgrounds. Um, so they come with very different values, very different norms, very different languages. And we thought it was important, you know, to acknowledge this. Um, we also talked about this importance of relationships and that that really is the basis for their well-being and learning. Uh, but we also wanted to acknowledge that every children at the moment that they come into the school already have their own history, their own wishes, their own talents, their own fantasies and their own dreams. And positioning really children as very curious, inquisitive people that want to connect with people in the world around them, hey? That they are meaning makers, that they're constantly seeking to understand the world around them, that they're asking questions either verbal or with the way they interact with materials. Um, and in this way, they really create an image of themselves and the world, and they adjust this based on, you know, the new information that they encounter. So children are active, full of wonder and ideas. Oh, sorry. They think both critically and creatively, and they also have different ways to express themselves. Okay? So all children, all uh, human beings are capable of analyzing ideas, pulling it apart, putting it back together to make connections, to think about cause and effect, to use their gut feeling to make unexpected connections between ideas, concepts, materials. Uh, we, we can all do that. Um, all children can do that. And, and they have different ways of expressing themselves. And I think even this statement has an impact on the kind of environment that we create for children. For example, ensuring that there's a, a range of materials that they can use to express themselves. So we also talked about the fact that we have confidence in children, you know, that we, we, we trust them in the choices that they make when they play and that play is a space of choice where they can direct their own learning. Um, so there's lots of ownership in play and um, in play they also become, and through play they become part of a learning group. So my question for you would really be, you know, what would be a way to perhaps rethink the way you think about children's identities, their rights and responsibilities? Because the way we think about children is really shaped by the way we've been brought up, um, our cultural uh, background, uh, the places that we've lived in, um, our, our family context. Um, so we all bring certain ideas about what children can and cannot do, you know, what they're allowed or not allowed to do, the kind of experiences that we provide for them, but what might be ways that we could rethink our views on children's identities, rights and responsibilities. So there you go. Love to hear, you know, what you make of this question.
this takes me like nine years ago when I invited you to Dubai and we had this exercise with our teachers and then um, this image of that child that was a little bit negative, they don't do, they are not independent, do you remember? Huh? And then yeah. it's really about, again, the culture where we are in place and time and then how do we see those kids? So let's check. Uh, yeah. And Ali, that. you know, you actually bring up a really important point. Eh? I think the fact that, you know, we acknowledge children and appreciate them for what they are now instead of what they're not yet, you know what I mean? And, and, and looking through, yeah. uh, through the lens of what they are who they are now mm. so uh not being not judgmental live a day like a child uh, be a child for a day reflect and share with that child and other teacher give them the voice uh, allow them enough time to uh, like allow yourself enough time to observe the children um I try to use their way of thinking and seeing the word, uh, make sure that the engagement you are offering are age appropriate and provocative, uh, allow for mistakes, and uh, voila, the chat is very fast, let me go down, uh, trust them, uh, be open to their perspective, uh, be in their shoes, talk to them, uh, maybe also go down to their level sometimes, even physically, if we are on the same level, it allows us to see a, a different perspective. Accept and honor the wonder. Lovely. Those are really poignant responses. Thank you for that. And I really love, you know, that somebody who talked about this importance of, you know, the um, opportunity to reflect with others on children's learning and, and get those perspectives. Uh, and also the importance of listening and taking the time, hey, to listen, to look, to observe, uh, observe, and so on. And that kind of takes me also. I have a this. beautiful quote. I'm not sure if you know Khalil Gibran. He's a he's a Lebanese poet mm -hmm. and author, very famous. He wrote the the Prophet. And then uh, I have a quote from him about. Uh, his perspective about the children and he said your children are not your children they are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself they come through you but not from you and so they are with you yet they belong not to you yes yeah well yeah that's a beautiful quote hey when you yeah. think of that image of the child yeah wow. yeah and I think, you know, like what we believe about learners also um, influences, you know, what we notice. Right? So if you look at those images, for example, you know, the photographs that I took of some of the children in, um, in my school, I think it's, you know, when we have a certain idea about children, and I really see them so much as meaning makers, as Uh, yeah, it seems we lost Anne. So let me check. Maybe she has a internet problem. That was stressful. So yeah, I think the point that I wanted to make was. Ooh, I need to recover from this. Um, you know, that we uh, not only need to talk with teams about um, the, the identity that we give to um, children, but we define learning. Like, and I think that that would be an interesting question too. Hey? And so, you know, like, what does learning look like for very young children? Hey, what is the way that they construct meaning? What is the way that they engage with the world? And what we all know, of course, I'm saying, of course, is, is that young children's primary tool to construct meaning is play, and particularly free play, right? When they make their own choices, when they direct their own learning, because then you get that sort of deep engagement. And that's also where you then see the development of those really important skills. So play really is the signature of, uh, of childhood. I really love this quote by Alison Gopnik. Um, it's learning in action. So I think when you talk with teams and when you start with them by how important and, and recognize um, you know, how important play is for young 
children, you know, that has a consequence, right? If this is what you believe, if you, this is what you put in your, you can rethink your schedule, the way you can rethink your spaces, the way you're going to bring in more materials that facilitate play, but also your own role as an educator. Because I think um, play, really needs and I think this is an important point to make I think uh, perhaps uh, we're used to think that you know play is a time you know that children kind of you know do their own thing and, and we do something else uh, but when we put play in the heart of our practice, then we really need to think about ways that we can support the children in their learning while they're playing. We need to document the play to figure out what children are figure out, figuring out. Um, we need to be active participants, sometimes observers. We need to think about ways that we um, uh, set up the space. You know, there's so many things that we need to uh, do and dipping out of these different roles when children are playing. Uh -huh. um, and I think that that's important. Um, but we also need to think about ways that we uh, structure children's day to ensure that there's big blocks of time that children can engage with materials, each other, and so on. A playing needs time. And we need... I don't know what's happening with Anne, so... I wanted to share with you an example, you know, of, of, of the beauty of play and this idea of playfulness, of being playful with ideas and so on. Um, so this was actually when I was working as a consultant with the school in uh, Moscow. Um, so this was all part of a investigation under for the PYP folks there under how we share the planet. And it was all about, you know, this idea that um, resources are um, um, not unlimited right and that we need to be careful about the way that we re use resources because it has an impact on uh, on um, on um, finite resources that we have um, on the planet uh, and then at some point the children became really sort of in, uh, intrigued by this idea of uh, reusing materials hey? and that not everything can end up um, uh, in a landfill right that we should be reusing things so that we reduce our footprint um, so the children uh, made this idea that they wanted to create a fix it shop, right, where people in the community could bring things that they could fix. Uh, but then there was a problem um, because the uh, children had created this fix it shop, but then nobody came. Uh, and then there was one person in the community who decided that he uh, wanted to make an advertisement for the fix it shop. And that's what you're going to see next. Welcome to our fix it shop. If you've got some broken things, I'm here to fix them. You have to fix the plates, see? I did it with, with a little bit of plastic and clay, and I stitched to the pieces together. And look, ta da! -da! I made a plate. So, and if you've got some broken things, come here. I'll fix them. This was the first book. This was the first page which is fixed. So, so there is no page here, and there was no boat. So that's the boat, and there was no, and the key was not fixed. So I made a key down here, and I made it. Ta -da! And and then here I made flowers, and they're beautiful. So I made and there was no home. Oh, so I made a home as good as new, very very very. If you've got some broken things, we made it fix it. Come to our classroom and you drop it on in this box and then we will fix it in no time and send quickly in no time to this box. Those are the things which we fix. A diamond from a plate. A broken, a broken cup. Which we fix it with crystal. That was a not easy one. With glue. And we also fixed a broken rock and a broken wood which has cracked. 
If you've got some sin broken, give your toys and we'll fix them just in one minute. Or we if you've got if you've got a book which we'll which is broken, we'll fix it. If you've got a computer, we will fix it with a screwdriver. So it's a fix it up regularly. Click, click, click. It's a very, very skilled presenter, isn't he? Eh? <laughs> so, Anne, I think we got like uh, more than 100. This is great and uh, lovely and uh, amazing. So we are inspiring our attendees, even if we are still facing some technical problem. And we just got a comment uh, that it happens to everyone. So don't worry. <laughs> I, you know, and I think it just speaks volumes, right, of the kind of responsiveness of the teacher and her intentionality and um, the capabilities of this particular child, hey, who was so invested in this advertisement, um, uh, but also about documentation. And uh, often we create these really beautiful panels, uh, particularly those of you who work with pedagogical documentation, but sometimes it can be also um, so as easy as making sort of a quick note, right? Um, so I love this one, um, Alex, who said, as well, I just did some clay and made a model puddle of fire for Miss Taylor when she uses her phone and she can see a nice picture. And I think that that's just really sort of delightful, hey, this idea that you can fix a broken phone. Hey? And I think we're all postponing. I think the children also know that they, it can't be really fixed. But hey, it's a playful way of interacting um, with each other, uh, which I think is delightful. Uh, and this is Yanni who says, my mom gave me a cup that was broken. I bring it to school to fix. I started, it started like a puzzle, but I think I did it wrong. So I had to take it apart and then do it again. You know, like so, so some reflection there, hey? Use glue, but it didn't work. I fix it with the wire. It can be used again. And it really shows, you know, how invested the children are, hey, in, um, um, in, 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 in this initiative, you know, the action that they took based on, um, you know, what they'd learned. So it really is about, I think, a responsiveness and intentionality that is required from educators that grows from a deepened understanding of what we believe about learners and what we believe about learning. Um, so, but how can we achieve that way of planning? You know, what are your ideas? I'd love to hear from you. Hey, what you think? Um, how can we um, response, uh, response, you know, in, to what we've noticed in the children's learning? So, well, let's check. The people who are asking for the recording, it will be on the YouTube channel. Please check the YouTube channel and then it will be published by the end of the day or maximum tomorrow. Now, the answer to the question, uh, Karen, she said, keep your schedule flexible. Uh, put the children at the center of your teaching. Um, I have, uh, what else in the chat, ideas that we are getting about planning in response of uh, what we have noticed. Uh, reflect daily on photographs and notes. Uh, have variety of materials, uh, plan some exploration uh, areas in the classroom, and know our curriculum well, so you know when is the teachable moment and that you can pick on it. Uh, pedagogical documentation, unpack how to move forward with the learning, a scaffold only of planning, flexibility, student-driven, not teacher-driven, keep the conversation open, include them in the planning. Um, I've done it, like I invited them to planning meeting, but it was from grade one and above, not earlier. So uh, let the student take the initiative, uh, provide different resources, different environments, let them solve the problems, and then uh, keep a balance. This is very good between interfering and interacting. Um, moving from content coverage to being responsive to their needs, uh, and voila, plenty of other ideas in that chat. Anne. Yeah, uh, and I think we need to be so thoughtful hey, and so conscious of the way um, we interact with children, particularly when they're playing. I think all mm -hmm. the time, but you know what I mean? When children are in play, you know, what is the way, you know, how are we responding, right? And are we kind of interjecting and interfering with their play? Are we supporting the play? And, and, and what is the way to do that? Uh, and that's really, really complex. Kelly, Kelly mentioned a nice comment on, she said, present their work back to them and discuss and ask them what's next. Yeah. 
yeah, wonderful. Um, and I've noticed that I'm doing that more and more where I take the documentation back to the children and I say, we talk about their learning and kind of checking in if like, this is what I've noticed, uh, Matil, um, and tell me what you think about what I think about your learning. Uh, and that kind of takes me to uh, my next point, And that really is about the importance of documentation. Just this morning, I was working with a group of educators and um, it's about intentionality and planning. And, 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 and the link was very quickly made, hey, between planning and documentation. So when we engage in um, this cycle of observation, documentation, interpretation, and planning, we stay connected to children's thinking. And I think we can avoid, um, you know, what I call the activity trap, you know, that we just kind of get caught in thinking of cute activities rather than um, staying connected to the children's thinking. Uh, and this is a real challenge, I think, for all of us. Eh? And we're, we all have ideas of things that we've done before, um, things that we've seen on Pinterest, be perhaps books that we have with wonderful ideas, um, but then we are thinking of activities and we're not staying connected to what the children are trying to figure out. And I think documentation really helps with that. Okay, so more we document children's um, conversations, we take photographs, we take videos, we uh, look at our um, anecdotal notes, we look at uh, the drawings that children uh, create or uh, paintings, it can be anything, uh, structures they build, they're all pieces of documentation, uh, pieces of information that help us to figure out um, where to next. So from this identity of children and the identity of learning, we now get to you know, the, the, the practical um, outcome of these ideas, right? That idea of staying connected to children, uh, but also keeping in mind, and I love that comment, Ali, about uh, sort of being fluid with your curriculum outcomes, your learning goals, your standards, knowing them well, so knowing when to respond, and keeping track of the things that you've made connections with or that individual children have made connections with and things that they haven't learned yet so that you can provide that appropriate scaffold in the moment and be responsive to individual children instead of kind of thinking that all children need to reach an outcome at a particular point in time. And I think this is an important point to make, hey, because that kind of goes back to what um, uh, something I mentioned earlier. You know, if we really see children as unique individuals, you know, then we need to be responsive to where each individual child is at. So documentation really as a reflective process. I love this quote uh, by Wendy Shepard. Um, so she really sees it as a pedagogical practice that provides multiple insights and maybe multiple perspectives. Hey, when we bring documentation to our planning meetings, when we talk about what we've seen, what we've noticed, what we think this means on a conceptual layer. For example, um, last year I had a group of children who kept on going back to the um, um, block area and they started building these rams. And you know that was all about acceleration. And, and I think if we can figure out that deeper conceptual layer, okay, instead of thinking, you know, they like to play with the blocks um, or with the cars, you know, then we can also think about ways that we can uh, deepen that uh, theory, that investigation. So it gives us insight into how children think, what they want to be engaged in, but also our own thinking, our own understanding about how children learn. So we want to learn more about how children learn, don't we? And we want to engage in critical reflection uh, so that we can comprehend and unravel the wonders of ch children's learning. And I think that that might be a nice way to kind of end this uh, short presentation and um, continue to the questions. Ali, what do you think? Shall we continue? Shall we start with the questions now? Let's go ahead. So I have one question saying, what would you recommend for a setting where some teachers are not willing to discuss, reflect on, and rethink the image of the child? Lovely question. So going back to the beginning of our discussion today. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, what, what you could do then first is start 
talking with each other about what kind of professional discourse do you want to have in your school, right? And, and, and to me, I'd say, particularly if you're an inquiry-based school, then we need to be inquisitive too, right? <laughs> we need to live that same discourse, um, you know, like, so I think that that would be a start to really talk about, you know, how, how do we want to learn and grow together? Because we all want to, right? And maybe that's the first thing uh, to research. Because uh, there is actually some uh, evidence that when teachers um, engage in uh, critical reflection, um, inquiry processes, you know, they also become better inquiry teachers. So maybe that is your place to start. Uh, and I would also say, you know, like that build relationships with people, build the trust. Hey, if it's not there yet, you know, then you can't force it. Then I would really take the time to invest in First of all, the relationships that you have with people, but also invest in the kind of professional culture that you want to build in your school. Like if that's not there yet, you know, like start there. Because um, what is part of learning is tension and being challenged and, 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 and understanding that there's things that you don't know yet or that you don't understand yet or that your own beliefs are being challenged. But that's all part of learning. That's what children do every day. Uh, but it's something that we need to do as well so i think we need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable good so let me go to my following question Anne, and then please feel free to send your question in the q and a um Anne is happy to answer as many as as we can and uh, the following one will take us on again to the documentation section and the question is about the strategies and tools that can help us effectively document the play? What are these strategies and tools? And then with this documentation, how can I take it to, uh, to inform my planning? So I'd like a, a two, two uh, steps question. Yeah, yeah. And you know what, Ali, I think our next presentation should be about documentation. And yes. <laughs> for days, for months, um, you know, like, so I'm going to answer this question quite um, shortly, right? Yes. It's, it's a really, really big question. Um, and, and, and I think when you start researching uh, this question uh, with other educators, uh, you, you're in for a treat. And there's a lot, lots um, that you can find um, online, but also email me. I'll send you some uh, documents. But I think, you know, there's a range of materials that we can collect, right? If you think about documentation as really a sort of traces of evidence, right? So I'm thinking photographs, um, taking notes, short videos, keeping drawings, multiple drawings of the same um, subject. All of that is documentation, right? If we put that together, um, um, it can, be can become a, like a documentation panel. Uh, but I really like to kind of uh, work with those sort of like smaller pieces of, of evidence, you know, that we use to, um, uh, that we use for our planning. Uh, and I'd say, what you have to do, I think, is analyze the children's conversations, analyze your videos, um, talk with other people about what's going on here, you know, what are they trying to figure out? And how are they approaching this? Uh, and that takes time and practice, but I tell you, you know, the more you do it, the more you'll grow and understand how this works, but that's your own process. I, I remember once, you know, when I listened to somebody from Reggio Emilia, she said, you know, nobody can really teach you how to document. It's something that you have to teach yourself. And I thought that that was really very, very true. But I think particularly if this is something that you do with your whole team, you can support each other. And, uh... Uh, Shivani is asking about your email. It's just here on the screen, so you can take a screenshot and then you can email on. We were talking about documentation and I'm sure everyone in this webinar and live on Facebook, they would like to know maybe one tip about how to document effectively online, especially that many schools are still teaching now online. So can we get one tip about this? Yeah, well, I think many schools are using Seesaw, hey? so then the documentation is also in Seesaw, right? Like oh, yes, and when you mentioned this in the chat, so you agree on a kind of a Seesaw is a good application to document and to have some digital kind. Because we don't have Seesaw, so we ask parents to send us photographs. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like um, again, last year with my daughter, uh, we we don't have CISO, and then uh, but then this year they are using the uh, they are using it. But then last year we had to record short video, take photos, email them to the teacher, and then the teacher were uh, commenting, and then sometimes embedding these uh, documents in the report card at the end of the year we had some of these. Yeah, and one of the things that we're doing, Ali, is is that we use those photographs because we create short videos for children, mm -hmm. uh, and and one of those video so we've got a couple per day um you know that we we um you know, take um we print the images you know the things that parents have sent us and then we talk about the things that children have been doing at home so we kind of want to try to kind of reconnect children with each other and the ideas so it's still that co-construction of meaning even when they're not in the same space right so we're the ones that will bring those ideas together I'm going to take one more question, Anne, if you don't mind. And then I have two people who asked like the same question, but in different structure. Uh, how do we work with those kids who are non-native English speakers? And then English is the language of instruction. We are in early years. They don't want to talk. They don't know how to respond. So any advice about how to engage them and then help them develop the language of instruction? Yeah, I'm going to answer sort of in light of the conversation that we just had, right? Or the presentation that you've just listened to. And I think that that's really sort of like, first of all, you know, that image of the, the uh, additional language learner is something sometimes also one of incompetence uh, and, and, and also one of um, um, perhaps, no, okay, let's just stay with this word incompetence, right? Like, and I, and I think we need to acknowledge that these children also come to school with already a, first of all, a language that they can express themselves in, uh, but also that they're powerful thinkers and that there's different ways that they can express their understandings, mm. right? So I think that that's what we need to connect with. Um, and I think when we, we, we start to think about this differently and we think about, you know, they haven't learned the language of instruction yet, you know, <laughs> uh, then I think uh, the way we start interacting with this child is different too, because we understand it's a provisional space, you know, eventually they'll learn it, right? When we just, we, we engage with where they're at in that point in time. I, I was recently uh, giving a workshop like this week on to a group of a new teacher. So they will start teaching in September. And then while I was like picking on their prior knowledge, I said, you can answer in Arabic, in French, in, in English, you can draw. And so by giving all this opportunity, I was again shaping this image of the child that they are going to face and telling them that if they come to your class with zero French, it doesn't mean that they don't know. Yeah. It, it will come at a later stage. Yeah, and then, I, I wish we just could move away from this idea that this is a problem. You know, it's yes. an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is not a problem. This is like part of the learning process. Uh, Anna is mentioning time is key here. Give them time, give them different ways. Um, and uh, what else? Let me pick one more question. Uh, <laughs> this is a nice one. Uh, so related to leadership team. And then what would you respond to that leadership team wanting to plan everything in advance and map all the standards and all the expectation and to put as much as detail uh, possible in the plan? <laughs> Yeah, so that sort of goes back to my earlier point, hey, you know, then it's really time for a conversation about how young children learn, right? <laughs> also acknowledging, um, you know, but I think that this pertains to every learner, you know, every learner is unique, every learner learns in a different way, um, and particularly in early childhood, you know, in play, because it's so fluid. Um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, right? We don't know where it's going to end up, you know, like, so we need to be comfortable I think with that sort of fluidity and that unexpectedness you know because if we do that then we really get that power of learning hey that deep engagement uh, and the uh, amazing development of skills um, and knowledge and so on um, so I think it is really about um, shifting beliefs right and sometimes we need to um, we need to connect school leaders with pieces of research we need to bring them to other schools we need to bring them in contact with other specialists uh, and so on and and this may take a while right uh, like i said earlier you know like um it takes sometimes a, a while before we shift our beliefs and that's okay 
Uh, but I think it is important that we're advocates for young children and, um, and that we continue to have those conversations. Good, so I'm going to invite you to take a short break and then we are uh, continuing with art or we're going to continue with play therapy uh, with another IB educator, a different perspective. And then uh, if you are interested in joining, you can still register via the website or watch us on Facebook Live. And thank you again for this beautiful moment. Thank you everyone for being here with us. And uh, yeah, it's always an amazing experience. Uh, so um, if you want to stop sharing the screen and then you can see all these beautiful messages in the chat. Uh, yeah. uh, so um, as I said, two more webinars for this afternoon. Uh, one about uh, learning and how to transfer the learning using concepts and one about play therapy. So feel free to join us or via Zoom or via Facebook. And have an excellent afternoon and hopefully we will meet soon face to face. I hope so too, Ali. Good luck, hey, with your yeah. uh, your date. Sounds exciting. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>